Welcome in once again to the Edward Jones Chatting Cage. Tim McMaster here and stepping into the cage today, we have Jeff Blum, broadcaster for the Houston Astros, longtime player. A lot of that time is also spent in Houston with the Astros. Jeff, thanks for taking some time with us. No, it's great to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity. All right, fans, you know how to get involved. You can use the hashtag Chatting Cage on social media. Use the MLB Fans app or hit that Get In Line button, and you can ask your own questions of Jeff Blum. Uh, Jeff, we're going to start on social media, and Waka Flacka 4 wants to know, what made you decide to become a broadcaster, and what inspired you to, to do it? Uh, great question. It's not one of those things that I was actually thinking about until I uh, retired. Uh, when I was coming up through the league, I never said no to an interview. I knew that there was plenty of opportunities to be seen. But uh, as my career went on, I had more opportunities to do radio shows. Uh, and again, never turned out an interview. If I won the game, lost the game, I was going to answer every question they had. Uh, luckily, I can complete a sentence every once in a while. So I think that appealed to a lot of people. Um, I think going to Cal for my uh, schooling was pretty good. But uh, it's not something I put my mind out to go do. I knew that when I retired, I had a good career, but I didn't really kill it as far as the bank account is concerned. And having four kids, I needed a retirement plan. And right now, it seems like broadcasting is working out pretty good. It certainly is, and you certainly have a fun team to cover right now. But 14 years in the major league, so we're not going to let you sell yourself short. You had a great <laughs> major league career, and we have a fan ready to go with us right now. Fan, go ahead, tell us your name, where you're from, and ask your question for Jeff. Hi, my name is Ariana. I'm from Texas, and I just wanted to ask, uh, what's your all-time favorite baseball memory? Uh, it's interesting that somebody from Texas is going to ask me about my favorite baseball memory. There are plenty of playing for 14 years. Uh, one of my most favorite is 2003 when I was in the opening day lineup playing third base for the Houston Astros, and I took Dan Maselli deep in front of a sellout crowd here at Minute Maid Park. But uh, if you ask most Houstonians what they remember about, about my career, is probably that World Series moment in Game 3, unfortunately. It was one of those bittersweet moments, but it, it's something I don't want to take away from my career. We won a World Series, and I just happened to hit a home run that uh, – uh, maybe drove a stake through the heart of some of the uh, Astro fans here. But they've welcomed me back, and trust me, deep down in my heart, in the heart of Texas, I am a, I'm a Houston Astro. I'm glad you got that question out of the way right away because the, <laughs> yeah. that one was uh, that was lining up a little bit, Jeff, through social media. People wanted to hear about that home run, and obviously the people of Houston have welcomed you back with open arms. We have, a, we have another fan ready to go. What are your hopes for the Houston Astros for the next five years? Beautiful. I appreciate that question, Patrick. And I like that uh, the young man was asking about the the next five years for the Houston Astros because I think they've really aligned themselves to be good for the next four or five years. Uh, we know they have a young core. Altuve's locked up in a contract. We know we hear the word, the term club control. And uh, Carlos Correa is a guy that falls into that category. Uh, Alex Bregman is another guy. George Springer. These guys are going to be coming up for contracts in the next three or four years. But I think that the way they line up with the club control and some of these contracts, they should be good for the next four or five years. What's great is that they've gelled so quickly and they've grown own together so I think they should be really good for the next four or five years and they should be playoff contenders this year for sure if they add another arm maybe they get some World Series contending going but uh, I think for the next four or five years you're going to hear a lot of people talking a lot of good things about the Astros and we're going to be talking about them in October. Yeah, it'll be certainly interesting to see if they do add that arm at some point during 2017 as well. Jeff, it's now time for our EDJ question of the day and the question today who's your favorite current Astro to watch? Oh, man, you, I've got to narrow it down to one. I, I, I'd rather pick like a batting group because there's about four or five guys I really enjoy watching. But uh, George Springer is by far the more, most exciting. But uh, having come up as a shortstop in my young career and being a guy that's about six foot four playing that position, I understand how hard it is. So for me, watching Carlos Correa play shortstop on a daily basis is really a pleasure. I know a lot of people are going to bring up the offense first, but I think he plays a fantastic shortstop. We know the Astros employ a lot of shifts that allow him to be in better positions to make some more fantastic plays, but he's got a great glove, great arm. Uh, he has a certain enthusiasm about him playing with Altuve to his left, but uh, when that guy steps in the box, too, you better be watching because something magnificent can happen at any moment when he has that bat in his hand. Yeah, and I think we're going to see the best of Correa this year. He had nagging injuries a year ago that I don't think people even realized, and, and the numbers maybe took Good a point. tiny step back. He's going to be tremendous in 2017. Back to social media we go, and back to your playing days, Jeff. Red Bostonian wants to know, how was it playing in Australia in the wintertime early in your career? 
<laughs> That's a great question. And you know what? I, I, I reflect fondly on those times in Australia. It was ba after the first uh, short season of my career. Uh, I believe it was the winter of 94, 95. And I use the term winter uh, uh, very minimally because in Australia, wintertime here in America, it's summertime down there. And being a California kid, I got off the plane in Australia and realized it was 75 and sunny every day and, and, and couldn't be more happy about the situation. Best part about that is, is that there was a local surf shop in Hunter, the city we were playing in, that gave us, uh, me and a guy named Neil Weber, who was a California kid also, a couple of surfboards, bodyboards. So we spent a lot of time out there on the beaches. But my best memory about uh, playing in the, the Australian Winter League was the guys on the team, number one. Number two is that I won a gold glove down there. So that was pretty cool. Awesome. That's great stuff. This is the Edward Jones Chatting Cage. Your chance to get in line, ask your own questions for broadcasters and players. And Jeff Blum, lucky, uh, happy enough to take some time with us today. And we have another fan ready to go right now. Go ahead, tell us your name, where you're from. And I know you're an Astros fan, judging by your hat. Go ahead with your question. Hi, this is Tom Dill, stationed in Groton, Texas, Groton, Connecticut, from Houston, Texas, my hometown. My question for Jeff Blum is, did, during your time in San Diego with the Padres, did you ever visit any military bases or any Navy ships? And it, when you did, what was your experience like? Great question. I appreciate your service if you're a service, first service member. But uh, San Diego was a great experience for me. I, you know, obviously being a Southern California guy and playing three years in San Diego, the teams actually do a fantastic job of getting us out there in the community and going to visit a lot of those guys down there. Um, I've had the opportunity to meet Marcus Luttrell. Obviously, the Lone Survivor uh, book that he wrote after being a Navy SEAL was a good one. Uh, but we had a chance to go down and visit a lot of veterans. Uh, we went been to a couple of veteran hospitals and stuff like that, talking to those guys and reflecting on some of the stories and hard work it's taken them uh, after they've served their country. So San Diego did a very good job. I hadn't had a chance to get on any Navy ships out there. I know there's plenty, and I know Trevor Hoffman was one of the guys that would actually take off during the middle of the afternoon before games and go for a jog along that San Diego Bay and cruise by some of those ships. But uh, we've done a good job in San Diego as far as reaching out to the military. And I know Houston, when Ed Wade was the general manager here, every time we went through D.C., we went through the uh, Veterans Hospital hospitals up there and visited with a lot of those guys and encouraged them as much as they encourage us by their service. Yeah, I know Major League Baseball as a whole does a great job. Obviously, last year, the, the game on the base as well. Uh, back to social we great. go. Yeah, and, and uh, St. Vin wants to know, there was pressure last year on the Astros with the large expectations, and it seems those expectations are even bigger now, obviously, after the offseason they had. Is the clubhouse able to focus on the one day at a time, or are they feeling the pressure from the media and fans? Um, I, you know what? They're not. They're never going to admit to it. I know that as a player, when you have those expectations, you just try and play it down and go out and play your game. But we're human. Those guys are human in the clubhouse. They read the papers. They hear the tweets. Uh, they see the media reports. So they understand that there is a target on their back. They also understand that they do have a very good ball club. I guarantee you when these guys sit down and look across the way, they understand that these guys are here for a reason. That reason is to win. In 2015, they maybe overachieved a little bit, snuck into the playoffs, and almost beat the Kansas City Royals 2016 they did have the target on their back and maybe panicked a little bit because they were so young to the process but now with the addition of Beltron McCann Reddick Charlie Morton's another guy that's a salty veteran in that rotation hopefully to solidify that back into that rotation these guys now understand the expectation the last year they learned how to play with the expectation now I think there's a little bit of a chip on their shoulder to go with that target so it should be a good year for these guys yeah, they had so much young talent that they brought up through that system. And now that final piece, I think, was to add those veterans into the equation as well. We have another fan getting ready to go here, waiting in line, and here they are. Fan, just go ahead and tell us your name, where you're from, and go ahead with your question for Jeff. Hello, my name is Andrew, and I'm from Houston, Texas. And I was wanting to know, what do you think about George Springer's home run last night? Uh, George Springer on a whole? Uh, his uh, he, his home the... run last night oh. is uh, the specific. <laughs> Yeah. No, that was pretty impressive. I was actually sitting in the booth. You kind of sense it with George Springer. We're actually going to talk about it a little bit in our show because I'm pushing uh, our producer to talk a little bit about George. But he's got great numbers in that leadoff spot. But it's interesting that he's in that leadoff spot and he finds himself in those situations later in ball games, namely some extra inning times where he's hitting about 355. But uh, he's a guy that I think really – 
relishes the moment. He likes the flair for the dramatic. We've seen some big plays from him in the outfield to save some pitchers, but we've also seen him in situations to have some key walk-off hits. And last night was one of those times. I thought it was a great matchup with the off-speed that DeJong had against him. But once he got to that 3-2 count, I didn't think he was going to get a fastball. I thought he was going to get a, a slider. He knew it, sat on it, popped it up. But how about him using the home field advantage of the Crawford boxes out there? Because if you watch the replay really close, it barely snuck into the that last seat in the very front corner of that Crawford box. But when that guy comes up, a lot of people watch it, and we love to watch him celebrate. Yeah, certainly, and, and what a way to get a big win early on in the season as well. Back to social media we go, and Dave the Brave wants to know, when you were playing, and I mentioned early on that 14-year career, Jeff, when you were playing the game, did you notice the game evolve from when you started to when you finished up? Oh, absolutely. I, I was in a unique case where I started at the end of the 90s and I played through the early millennium through the first 10 years and then finished my career starting into this basically the sabermetric era, I believe, with all the analytics coming through. And uh, I was lucky enough that I watched some of my ABs on videotape to DVD to digital recorders. So uh, that's the evolution of how guys get ready for games but yeah I got to see a little bit of it and I you know what unfortunately unfortunately I got to play through some of the steroid era so I got to see when guys were really really big dominating the game and putting up massive power numbers to a little bit of the evolution of the uh, the you know the natural player coming back and pitching making a, a bit of a move but now you're starting to see some of the analytics come into play for some of these players uh the talk of hitting is something i love to do when i talk to the hitting coach here with the houston astros dave hudgens the communication these guys have between hitting coach and hitter now is completely different and i'm learning i'm learning launch angles i'm learning uh, you know scap flex and stuff like this for to get guys ready to go so it has evolved a lot i'm trying to embrace the process and learn just like some of these fans are because it's not so much much about the batting average home run and RBIs now. Now you're listening to OPSs, weighted runs created and things like that. So I think it's really interesting to now sit back, enjoy the game, how it's played physically, but also have the numbers to back up what these guys are doing. Yeah, certainly. Now we have StatCast as well here at MLB.com and all those yeah. numbers that just build and build and build. Uh, this is the Edward Jones Chatting Cage. We have another fan getting ready to go here and join us in the cage. And here we go. Uh, fan, go ahead. Tell us your name, where you're from, and ask your question for Jeff Blum. Hi, I'm Jeff from Houston, and I just wanted to know who was the funniest teammate you ever had? The funniest teammate I ever had? Uh, there, there's a couple of them. Uh, Mike Cameron, when I was in San Diego, was one of the better ones. Uh, he, he'd have a quick one-liner every once in a while, and he wasn't afraid to give you a little jab after a tough A-B. But he did it in good fun to you know, kind of keep you loose and understand that this game is hard and you've got to have a little bit of humility about it. Woody Williams, for me, was a, a pitcher who was on the mound when I was playing third base. We would have really good banter going back and forth because uh, he would give me a hard time if I didn't make a play for him. I'd come back at him and say, hey, man, quit getting up these rockets. You know, I've only got so much range. Uh, but Brad Awesome for me who's the manager now for the Detroit Tigers a very cerebral guy a Dartmouth guy but he was one of the guys that had a little more drier humor and a little more of that sharp wit in the moment that would just stick a dagger right in your back every once in a while and get a good chuckle from guys about around the clubhouse not too many pranksters though we don't hear too much that humor out of Osmus in his post-game comments, but it's good to know <laughs> it's, uh, it's in there somewhere all right we are actually out of time Jeff but thanks so much for joining us in the chatting cage no, I appreciate it. It was great, and thank you to all the fans out there, too. That'll do it for another edition of the Edward Jones Chatting Cage. Make sure you tune in again next time.